Hello and welcome. To use a cricketing metaphor, we last discussed the trigger movement which started the action of playing a bat towards the barrage of bodyline deliveries being served up by the British Parliament, aided and abetted by the dilatory ineffectiveness of the umpire, Her Majesty the Queen Elizabeth II, at the heads and hearts of the subjects of the British Commonwealth. For the members of the Magna Carta Society, this trigger was the approach to Leolin Price QC concerning how to proceed in dealing with the cascading acts of treason emanating from those charged with protecting and preserving our rights and freedoms. That video contained five images from the original submission to Leolin Price and although no doubt many people did take the, the time to read and study them, because of the enormous scope of this topic concerning constitutional law, it's important to become familiar with the arguments contained therein, that we may be able to convey the information to others and also rebut the claims which frequently arise from those who have a vested interest in promoting doubt and confusion as to the validity of Magna Carta and the rest of the Constitution. The first of them states that there is good reason to think, not to believe, but to think, that the treaties of Rome, Maastricht and Amsterdam are illegal in the UK, and that the acts which flowed from them were illegal and in fact amounted to treason. The next states that the justification for this view stems from the Magna Carta, which had recognised long-standing Anglo-Saxon laws, rights and customs, dating back to at least the time of Alfred the Great. The third reveals that Magna Carta was a treaty, not an act or statute, and that it could therefore not be repealed by Parliament, which it at any rate predated by decades. A treaty may be breached, of course, by any participant, but even in that breach it still stands. The Queen herself had publicly stated that Magna Carta was a treaty in a speech in New Zealand in 1997. The Magna Carta Society understood several immutable principles, which included that common law was the will and custom of the people, while statute law is the will of Parliament. The latter can give expression to common law, but cannot disregard it or repeal it. It may only improve it, by which is meant to extend the liberties already existing. Such extension, of course, must apply to all equally, since all are equal under the law. So what have come to be known as positive rights, which give privileges to some at the expense of others, are not constitutionally valid acts of Parliament or statute law. The fourth of these images points out that no Britain, including the police or armed forces, are above the law. We are all subjects of the Crown first. Parliament is made by the law and cannot therefore be above the law. It also states that Parliament is answerable to the people and must present itself to them for re-election every five years, thus maintaining the preservation of the people's sovereignty over Parliament. This is one issue where it can be argued that the Magna Carta Society didn't present a lawfully watertight case. As we have seen, elections can be manipulated, and as the society itself lamented, the lack of any political party presenting a dissenting view was an effective disenfranchisement of huge numbers of British voters. What is missing is the commitment to the concept of annulment by jury, whereby legislators who enact statute law which causes harm, loss, is fraudulent or deceptive, or causes breaches of the peace to be inflicted upon people in contravention of common law principles, may be brought to trial to account for the harms thus caused, just as any other subject may be held to account for harmful actions, and the offending legislation even struck from the books. 
That is the one true mechanism by which Parliament may be held to account, and the rule of the people preserved. However, at this stage, the society was simply concerned with the people becoming aware that there was action that could be taken under the Constitution to start a return to the rule of law and an end to institutionalised treason. Finally, in the fifth image, the rights of the people to freedom from arbitrary or summary judgment or dispossession were guaranteed by the right of appeal to the quorum of 25 barons thereby appointed. This established in perpetuity the authority of the House of Lords and its constitutional role. As we proceed through the submission, there follows a full text of Article 61, shown here. Given the current appalling state of ignorance of the law which permeates all levels of the community, including both those involved in administering what they erroneously believe to be the law, and those on the receiving end of being subjected to these abuses, it would perhaps be a great innovation to have copies of the full text of Article 61 displayed in every home, school, library and any public building as a constant reminder to people of their rights and the responsibilities of those charged with protecting and preserving them. The public buildings option is obviously not going to fly, given the present malign intentions of those usurping Crown authority. But there's no reason why those who understand what we're talking about shouldn't have it displayed in their homes for the education and arousal of interest of those visiting. The obvious answer to the inevitable question it would raise would be to simply say, that's the law in its entirety as things currently stand, and proceed from there. A reference then follows, describing the subsequent enactment in 1297 of Edward I's confirmation of the Great Charter Act, which contains the wording shown here. That is not a truly relevant event, since many detractors try to use this as a means of arguing the gradual removal by statute of important sections of the Magna Carta. And of course, its enactment by Parliament renders it vulnerable to annulment or repeal of subsequent Parliaments. This 1297 version is the one frequently displayed by our current duplicitous governments as a token of their commitment to the defence of our basic rights but is ultimately a fraud and a distraction from the binding power of the 1215 original. At the coronation of Henry III, John's successor, which was performed after he accepted the conditions laid down in Magna Carta, following a brief period of regent rule, this wording, very similar to that of Article 61 of Magna Carta, was included. From Bracton's great constitutional work, written some time between 1235 and 1259, we find this comment, quote, The law makes the king. Let the king therefore bestow upon the law what the law bestows upon him, namely dominion and power, for there is no king where will rules and not law, End quote. Having argued for the supremacy of law over monarchic or parliamentary will, the Magna Carta Society submission moved on to the topic of sovereignty. This it likened to the concept of uniqueness, meaning that it is an absolute. A thing cannot be almost unique because the term means literally the only one of its kind. Similarly, a sovereign either rules alone over their dominion or they are not sovereign because their authority is shared or subordinated to another. John Locke provided an insight to this concept when he stated, quote, Each man has a property in his own person. This nobody has a right to but himself, end quote. Each person is thus sovereign of himself or herself, and the same is true of a group. A group of individuals having banded together to form a nation either have sovereignty over that nation and its dominions, or they don't. There is no middle ground. 
Nations may form alliances for trade or in war, but each either has the option to withdraw from such arrangements, or if not, they are subject to restraints imposed by another and cannot thus be classified as sovereign. This again touches in passing on the absurd pejorative sovereign citizen, currently flavour of the month justification for excessive police aggression against those standing up for their rights against unlawful and illegal oppression by fake crown agents. A sovereign is one experiencing autonomy over their own body and possessions. A citizen, on the other hand, is classified as a possession of the state and may only reside therein or receive certain benefits with the express permission of the administrators of that organisation, which of necessity places some people in a position of legal inferiority to others. The two terms are thus mutually exclusive. One cannot be both a citizen and a sovereign being. It is an oxymoron. If all are equal before the law, we can be described as sovereign subjects, because to be subject to constitutional or natural law is a choice of will, made by those who enjoy sovereignty over themselves a priori, and who grant that same right to all others. Returning to our document, the Magna Carta Society correctly points out that as a constitutional monarchy, Britain must have a recognised sovereign. There cannot be both a local sovereign and a foreign power to which the subjects pay equal fealty. Such would be a lawful nonsense. They quote the 37th of the 39 Articles of Religion passed during the reign of Elizabeth I, which still have legal force and can be seen in any book of common prayer. It says simply, quote, The Queen's Majesty is not and ought not to be subject to any foreign jurisdiction, end quote. The Supremacy Act of 1559 includes these words shown here. They were repeated in similar spirit in the Declaration of Rights of 1688, though as we have already seen in other videos, elements of that declaration are clearly treasonous in their own right. Since it was never enacted, the Declaration of Rights stands basically as a treaty and like Magna Carta cannot be repealed. It has never been listed among the chronological tables of Acts of Parliament, which the Magna Carta Society thought could be a significant fact. The Declaration does, however, severely limit Parliament's ability to make changes. Clause 13 lays specific responsibilities on MPs to protect the best interests of those who elected them. But as already noted, there were groups of vested interests involved in ensuring as far as possible that these provisions were effectively negated over time, with what might be termed the common people systematically denied education about or viable participation in the legalese system already well established. The closing point of this talk is directed to the oaths of service or office that since Magna Carta have been required to be sworn by all Crown servants, including the judiciary. This is a vital point in our interfacing with police and alleged Crown agents, and we will be resuming the next video with a continuation of this crucial topic. Included in these oaths are commitments such as, quote, not to take into consequence or example anything to the detriment of the subject's liberties, end quote. Similarly, today's officers swear or affirm, quote, that they will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the monarch and their heirs and successors according to law, end quote, and that they, quote, will well and truly serve the monarch and will do right to all manner of people after the laws and usages of this realm without fear or favour, affection or ill will, end quote. Members of the armed forces swear equally unequivocal oaths of attestation which commit them to, quote, protect the monarch from all enemies and to uphold them in person, dignity and crown, end quote. 
The Magna Carta Society had at this point reached one of the pivotal issues of their case, which is the irreconcilable conflict between those oaths and the ones sworn by MPs to European commissioners upon their appointments to that body. We will find that just as yawning a chasm exists between the oaths our police and judiciary privately swear to the Bar Guild and their respective foreign registered employers, and the ones they publicly mouth to ostensibly serve and protect us. Until next time, thank you for watching.